welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time it's the second episode in our Linux survival guide, in which we're going to be looking at ways you can run at least some Windows applications when you've installed Linux. Various options are available, and here I'm going to be weighing the pros and the cons of using a Linux version of a Windows application, running Wine and related compatibility layer software, installing a virtual machine, setting up a dual boot, and accessing a Cloud Windows PC. So, let's go and get started. Right, just before we look at technical solutions, it's worth noting that whilst most Windows applications are not available for Linux, some of them actually are. So, for example, if you're used to working in LibreOffice and Firefox, these are both available for Linux, and even come pre-installed in many distros, for example here in Linux Mint, we can launch LibreOffice Writer as part of LibreOffice, there we are, and we can also roll up the Firefox web browser, which is also pre-installed. Other popular applications with both Windows and Linux versions include Audacity, Chrome, DaVinci Resolve, GIMP, the Thunderbird email client, and the VLC media player. And if you're a Windows user who doesn't run any of these programs, but you're thinking of migrating to Linux, then one way of making your journey easier is to try some of these applications in Windows before you make the Linux leap. In terms of pros and cons, using a Linux version of a Windows program is clearly the best possible solution. But sadly, most Windows software is not available for Linux, which is why things are about to get a bit more complicated. One way to run some Windows programs in Linux is to use Wine, which has its website here at winehq.org. As this notes, Wine is not a Windows emulator. Indeed, the acronym originally stood for Wine is not an emulator. Rather, Wine is a compatibility layer that allows Windows executable files to run by translating calls to the Windows operating system into calls to the Linux operating system. In some Linux distros, for example Zorin OS, Wine is pre-installed. But here I'm running Linux Mint and Wine is not pre-installed here, so we've got to add it to the system. And we could do this using the graphical install of a software manager, which I've got running over here, where I've done a search for Wine and it's come up, as you can see. But I would suggest you don't install Wine using the graphical installer in your system because you often don't get the latest version. Here, for example, we get version 5.0, whereas if we look on the website here, you'll see the latest version is actually version 6. So for the best Wine experience, you're best to install from the website. So I'll just take my scaling back down a bit so I can bring the download link back up over there, and we'll click on download, and you'll actually discover it's a set of instructions you get here. So if we go down here, you'll see we have to pick our distro, and because I'm in Linux Mint, it's based on Ubuntu, therefore I click on Ubuntu, and then on the next page, there's a set of instructions which need to be entered into the terminal. And this is a bit daunting, I know, but basically you need to take each relevant instruction. So the first one is that one there, and I'll copy that. I could also control C to copy. I'll run up a terminal and I'll paste each command in turn into the terminal, paste like that and enter. After the first one, I have to enter my password. And I'll now go back to the website and continue to enter all the relevant commands. And when we get to the final stage, you see we can pick which one to install. I would suggest going for the stable branch. You've probably have done that anyway. And there we are, the process has completed. So I'll close down the terminal and we should now have Wine on this system. It's worth noting that Wine does not work with all Windows software. And if we look on the website here, you will see there is an application database up here. And if we click on that, we can search to find out which software is supported on Wine and to what level. If we scroll down here, we'll also see a list of Platinum apps and a top 10 Platinum, top 10 Gold, etc. And one of the things that's very obvious here is that the vast majority of programs here are older games. We've also got uh, Microsoft.NET Framework there. We've got uh, Microsoft Office 2010. And at least in my experience, it's the case that Wine generally works best with older software. 
Anyway, to give you a little demonstration now we've got it installed, let's open up the file manager here and go to downloads because in downloads I've got this, which is the install file for Autodesk's Mesh Mixer, which is a nice little tool for working with 3D meshes, cleaning things up for 3D printing, things like that. And this is, of course, a Windows executable. We couldn't normally use it in Linux. But if I right click here, because we've got Wine installed, we can open with the Wine Windows Program Loader. So we'll do that. And Wine will come up like that. Great to see it. Now it's installed. And we'll just follow through this process. And there are clearly some bits of Wine to add we haven't yet got on the system. So it'll do that because it's the first time we've used it. And here we are now running the installer for Mesh Mixer. So I'll follow this through. There we are, and Mesh Mixer is now installed on this system. And you'll see there's a couple of icons we've added to the desktop. One is an LNK file. This is a Windows shortcut file, which we can get rid of. Just delete that. But if we now click on Mesh Mixer here, it should run up, hopefully in Linux. There we are. And we'll just bring in the sample bunny by way of example. There we are, we've got our sample bunny. That's nice, isn't it? And we'll do something simple. Maybe we'll go to Sculpt and we'll just give the, the bunny a, a longer nose. There we are. We've got the Windows Program Mesh Mixer running here in Linux. Now, whilst here Mesh Mixer has worked straight out of the box, installing and configuring Windows software using Wine can be a complex and frustrating experience. However, fortunately, there are many programs available to lend a hand. For a start, here on the website for Crossover, which is a commercial application based on Wine, which makes it far easier to get many Windows programs up and running. There's also a free package manager available from GitHub over here, which is called Wine Tricks, which again helps you to install Windows applications using Wine. And there's also a graphical front end to Wine called Play on Linux. And here I've actually got this running. If we go down there, you'll see I've just brought up its installer and all sorts of applications are listed, other multimedia, graphics, etc. So you can basically pick what you want and then from this, just click on it to do an install. And I found earlier 3D Train Studio, which sounded very exciting. So I've actually installed the Train Studio. So if we just bring that one up by running it, you will see that very quickly things get very exciting indeed. And in fact, we can make them even more exciting if we go up here to view and to cameras and we do the uh, cockpit camera and uh, whoa, isn't this exciting? Running 3D Train Studio, a Windows program running in Linux using Wine and installed via Play on Linux. As another alternative for gamers, we also have Lutris, which you can find on its website here. And this is a gaming client for Linux, which uses Wine as what it calls one of its runners for installing and playing Windows games. Finally, for gamers, Valve have created a modified version of Wine called Proton, which is specifically designed for running Windows games via Steam on Linux, as well as on its Steam Deck handheld console. To find out which games are compatible, you can come over to this website, protondb.com. And as you can see, lots of games have been reported, lots of games are here. You might find it's very exciting indeed to check this out if you're a gamer and you wish to move to Linux. Now, as you probably gathered, there's a lot going on with Wine and related programs that provide a compatibility layer between a Windows application and a Linux distro. On the positive side, such software allows compatible Windows applications to work directly in Linux with access to all available hardware resources. However, many applications do not work or do not work well. So, with the possible exception of gaming, in most cases, I personally recommend other solutions. Another way for Linux users to run Windows software is to use a virtual machine. This requires the installation of virtualization software such as VMware or Oracle's VM VirtualBox, which I've got installed here in Linux Mint. And this allows you to run Windows as a guest operating system inside a host Linux distro. Here, as you can probably see, I've got two Windows virtual machines set up. So let's launch that one, which is a Windows 10. There we are, and I'll just log in. 
and this is a virtual machine I set up a while ago so I could do a video while I looked at classic software like Netscape Navigator and run it safely without running it in a live version of Windows. But you could install any Windows program in a virtual machine, or just about any Windows program. The only programs you're going to have problems with are things like games or video editors that require direct access to a graphics card. Although this may be achieved using a function called pass-through if you have appropriate virtualization software and supported hardware. And just to be clear, we'll show you we're still running Linux here over there. We've got two operating systems running side by side. Here is Linux and uh, here is Windows. But uh, for now, we'll close down Windows 10. And uh, oh, look, it wants to update itself as it shuts down. It must be Windows 10 but it's got there, so let's now also show you my virtual Windows XP. And this is a machine I've copied across from my daily driver, and the reason I have this machine is so that when I'm working in Linux, I can go into nice versions of Word, or if I want to, also into, say, uh, PowerPoint and Excel. That's uh, good old PowerPoint, and uh, let's have Excel as well. I'm sure you've seen them before. I always like to see them come up. And I like these versions of Microsoft Office programs because they're the ones which were pre-ribbon, so I find these very nice to use. So this is a virtual machine I use a lot, admittedly, on another physical machine, and I use it offline, of course, because it's running Windows XP. Anyway, let's shut it down to get back to the Oracle VirtualBox Manager. And if you're wondering, setting all of this up involves quite a few steps. And last year I made a video all about how to get all of this working, where I detailed the process of installing VirtualBox, installing the Oracle extension pack to increase its functionality, enabling hardware virtualization in your PC's BIOS, installing a guest Windows operating system, adding what are called VirtualBox guest additions to Windows to again improve functionality, and finally setting things up to allow file and clipboard sharing as well as USB support. Now, clearly, there's no point in me reproducing my previous 21-minute video in this one. But I thought it'd be nice to quickly go through the process of adding a Windows 11 virtual machine to those I already have here. Note that to do this, you'll need to be running VirtualBox 6.1.28 or later, as Windows 11 support was only added in this version. And to do this, I recommend installing VirtualBox via the link on its website, which happens to be just there. Here's the various Linux distros we can install for. Here we would pick the uh, Ubuntu link because we're running Linux Mint. And if we simply on that said OK, we'd get a request like this to install the package. Obviously, I can't do that because it's already installed. I don't want to reinstall, but that's how you'd install the latest version of VirtualBox in Linux. So, Let's add a new virtual machine to this system where we can install Windows 11 to this system. So I'll click on New, as you would probably guess, and we'll call it Windows 11. It automatically picks up. That's what we want to do down here, you'll see. We'll go to Next. And now we need to allocate an amount of memory to the virtual machine. This is a 16 gigabyte computer we're on now. I'm going to give about half of that memory to the virtual machine. This is memory the virtual machine will take when we run it up. It'll give it back again when it's not running. But we inevitably have to split resources between the virtual machine, the guest operating system, and the host operating system when we're going to be running two operating systems at the same time. Next, we have to set up a virtual drive. I'll just take the defaults here. This is nice and straightforward and it wants 80 gigabytes. It'll only use the space it needs as it needs it, if you see what I mean, given how this is set up. So we'll click on Create there, and there we are. We've got our new Windows 11 virtual machine. I'm just going to click on Settings, and then go to System, like that, where you'll see we've already allocated half the memory to the virtual machine when it's running, but I'm also going to allocate half of the processor cores. It says there's eight CPUs here. That's actually eight threads on a quad-core system, but we'll give half to the, the virtual machine and click OK. Next, we'll run up a virtual machine like that. And because it's a new machine that hasn't run before, it asks us for a startup disk. So we'll go over here, and we need to find it, a startup disk. And you'll see there I've got the ISO for Windows 11. And that's there because I went to Add, and I went to it Downloads here, where I've already downloaded that ISO. I'll just show you that so you're clear where that's come from. And of course, I downloaded that from the Microsoft website. So we'll choose that, and then we'll go to Start. And we're now in the Windows 11 installer, where I'll set my language, and we can click on Install Now. 
And I don't have a product key, so we'll just say that down there. And I want to install Windows 11 Pro. And I also want to make sure we're offline when we do this so I can set up a local account. And to do that, I'm going to go down here to VirtualBox and I'm going to disconnect the network adapter. Now, when we've done that, we'll get to this message because our virtual machine doesn't meet the requirements for Windows 11. But we can fix this by going backwards and then pressing Shift F10 so we can run Reg edit the registry editor. And I'm going to apply the same hack I showed in my Windows 11 video, where we want to go down to H key local machine, and then system, and then setup, where we want to create a new key like that, which we're going to call lab config. Next, inside lab config, we're going to add a new D word, 32 bit value like that which we're going to call bypass TPM check. And then we're going to set the value of that key to one. Next, we're going to add down here another one of those in another D word value, this time to be called bypass secure boot check. And you can see if I just expand it out, that's what we've done. And again, we'll set the value to one. And then if we now close down the registry editor, we exit from this like that, and then proceed through the installer. And here we now are running Windows 11 in a virtual machine in Linux Mint. And at this point, we could go on to do more configuration, adding guest additions in VirtualBox to improve functionality, adding file sharing between the operating systems, things like that, all of which I cover in detail in the other video I mentioned earlier. But for now, I would conclude this section by noting that the big benefit of using a virtual machine is that almost all Windows applications can work, subject only to the constraints of direct hardware access. However, on the negative side, not all of a computer's CPU cores, RAM, and other resources can ever be available to a virtual machine, because as we saw during setup, a virtual machine can only ever be allocated a proportion of the available physical hardware. A fourth solution for accessing Windows applications is to run Linux and Windows on the same hardware, but not at the same time. This may be achieved in one of two basic ways, the first of which is to set up a dual boot by installing Linux and Windows on the same system drive with a boot menu called Grub that allows you to select between them when you turn on the computer. Most Linux distros provide this option during installation, and I've covered the setup process in depth in my video Ryzen Budget PC Build Number 4 Linux Mint Dual Boot. The main benefit of a single drive dual boot is that both operating systems have access to all hardware, so there are no constraints on the applications that Windows can run. However, you can't work with Linux and Windows software at the same time. Even more fundamentally, it's not that uncommon for a single drive dual boot to become corrupted, so preventing access to both Windows and Linux. Because of this, these days I usually recommend a virtual machine over a single drive dual boot for non-technical users who rely on their computer to remain fully operational. The alternative to a single drive dual boot is to have Linux and Windows installed on two separate drives. These may be physically switched in and out using removable bays, or selected on boot using a PC's BIOS menu. As I demonstrated in my video, Ubuntu 20.04 for Windows users, it's also possible to install Linux on an external drive that's plugged in as required, and again selected via a computer's BIOS boot menu to avoid the chances of a grub bootloader becoming corrupted. Once again, the benefits are that both operating systems have access to all hardware with no application constraints. However, modern UEFI BIOSes sometimes do not take kindly to regular operating system drive changes, so a risk of corruption still remains. So, be warned that any kind of dual boot can have its problems, which is why in recent years I've become such a big fan of virtual machines. Right, 
Just before we bring things to a close, I thought I'd point out that a final way to use Windows software if you run Linux is by accessing Windows online. Several companies now offer cloud Windows desktops, not least including Microsoft itself with Windows 365, which I covered in detail in a video a few months ago. Here in Zorin OS, as in any other Linux distro, all we need to do is to go to a web browser and go to the page windows365.microsoft.com where I've got an appropriate account and I've got a cloud PC, a Windows 365 PC, all ready to go. So we'll open it in a browser like that. We'll allow it access to various things on this physical hardware. And then we'll now have to put in a password. There we go. And once we're through that process, we'll find ourselves running a fully functional version of Windows in a browser here in Zorin OS. Here we can install and run most Windows applications, with the only things you can't install being programs that require a separate graphics card, like most games and high-end video editors. But other than that, this is a fully functional Windows PC that you can access inside Linux. In terms of pros and cons, on the positive side, using Cloud Windows allows you to run all Windows applications except those that require a graphics card or other dedicated hardware. But the downside is that Windows 365 and similar services are expensive with significant subscription charges. Without doubt, Windows is the best operating system for running Windows applications. So if you only or mainly want to run Windows applications, you should stick with Windows as your operating system. However, many people do want to make the transition from Windows to Linux. And in that context, it's often the case you need to retain access to at least some of your Windows software. And I hope that this video has given you useful information about the options that are available. In future episodes of the Linux Survival Guide, I'm going to be looking at things like networking, printing, and security. Although I've not decided the order of things yet, so if you've got particular preferences about what should appear in the next episode of this series, do let me know down in the comments section. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon.